In this video, we're going to discuss the visual system. So, let me begin by uh, giving you an overview of the different topics that we're going to discuss in this video. So, we will begin by discussing the anatomy of the eyes, and we'll also discuss uh, the appearance of the retina as viewed through an ophthalmoscope. Then we'll move on to discuss how light is actually going to be focused by the optic apparatus of the eyes onto the retina, and we'll discuss why that's so important. After that, we'll have a look at the structure of the retina, the microanatomical structure of the retina, or histological structure of the retina. So we'll have a look at the rods and cone cells, the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells. Uh, we will then move on to the topic of phototransduction within the rod and cone cells, i.e. how is a visual stimulus, how is light going to actually be um, transferred into an electrical signal uh, turned into some change in electrical activity within the rod and cone cells. So we'll have a look at that pathway in detail. Then what we'll do is we'll follow the story along and we'll go and have a look at the central visual pathway. So where is this electrical signal concerning visual stimuli actually going to be sent within the brain? So we'll have a look at how it's going to be involved in the pupillary light reflex. So we'll study the pupillary light reflex uh, in detail. And we'll also have a look at how it's going to be uh, transmitted along to the primary visual cortex. Finally, we'll end the video by having a look at um, how lesions to the visual pathway, the central visual pathway, uh, can result in different uh, visual abnormalities. So we'll have a look at the different results of the different uh, lesions to different portions of the uh, optic pathway. Okay, um, so to begin with then, let's start with the anatomy of the eyes. Okay, so we'll start with a little bit whoops, of anatomy, so anatomy specifically of the eye. Okay, so I'm going to draw a great big picture then of this, and the eye that I'm going to show you the anatomy of is going to be the right-hand eye, but of course you could just take the mirror image of this picture and you then have the anatomy of the left-hand eye. And the way that I'm going to actually draw you a picture is we're going to imagine taking a transverse cross-section uh, or a horizontal cross-section, depending on what language you prefer to use, of the right-hand eye, and we're imagining we've taken a cut right through the middle of it and we're going to see all the different structures. Again, we're imagining that we've taken a cross-section through the level where we will actually get the optic nerve coming out the back of the eye um, captured in our section. So we haven't missed the optic nerve at the level that we've cut through. Okay, so here we go. So we'll start off with the outer portion of the eye. So the way I'm going to orient it is uh, we're going to be looking from above. This is going to be anterior, this is going to be posterior, this is going to be medial, and this is going to be lateral. So let's begin. So right at the front, the outer layer at the front is going to be the cornea. So here's the cornea and then around the rest of the eye the outer layer is the sclera so this is all going to be the sclera and I apologize if I don't get it as a perfect circle but I'm trying my best here and then at the back towards the medial side this is where the optic nerve is going to come out like so so this is going to be cranial nerve 2 so I'll just label it up here. So CN2 there stands for cranial nerve 2, also called the optic nerve. Right, so now let's give this outermost layer an actual thickness, because at the moment it's just a line, so I'll give it a thickness here. So this is the outermost layer, and the sclera is continuous with the cornea at the front, like so, and it's also continuous with a layer that surrounds the optic nerve, as I'm showing here like so. So yes, my eye hasn't ended up as a perfect sphere, uh, but then mind, you get the overall message here. Okay, so I'll colour in this outermost layer in yellow. I hope this colour shows up. The light level isn't too bad, so I'm hoping it will actually show up on the camera. Okay, so all of this there is the outermost layer, which is the cornea at the front and the sclera behind, and um, the cornea, of course, is transparent. Light has to be able to get through the cornea because the pupil is going to be right in the centre here, so light has to come through the cornea, whereas the sclera is not transparent at 
tall, the sclera is going to be the white of the eye. So, uh, just to actually draw a picture from the front, so if this is a picture of someone's eye from the front, the bit that you'd actually see, of course this is generally what someone's eye will actually look like. You'll have the iris here, the pupil, which is the hole right at the centre, and then you've got the white of the eye here. The white of the eye is the sclera. This is all of this bit here that we'd be seeing here, and then the cornea covers up the iris. The iris is going to be back here. There's this chamber in front of the iris uh, which is covered by the cornea and light needs to pass through the cornea. So the cornea is transparent. And I'll put some of these labels on rather than just shouting at the camera. So this is the cornea here and it's going to be transparent whereas this piece of connective tissue, well this layer of connective tissue that it's continuous with, the sclera is opaque, it's white. And the reason for the difference between the cornea and the sclera's optical properties has to do with the way that the connective tissue fibres are all oriented together. In the cornea, the connective tissue fibres are all going to be perfectly aligned. It's going to be, have an incredible pattern to it. Okay, They're all going to be pointing in the same direction, all beautifully aligned. And this is responsible for its beautiful optic path, um, path, um, properties, rather, where it will allow light to pass through it, whereas the sclera isn't quite so beautifully aligned connective tissue, and therefore it's going to appear opaque, so it will interact with light in a different way. Okay, and then at the back, of course, the sclera is continuous with a layer of connective tissue that's going to surround the optic nerve. So, as I've implied now through what I've said, this outermost layer is connective tissue, okay? It's also worth pointing out that over the top of the sclera, on the surface of the eye, if we were viewing it like so, you would have the conjunctiva. But I won't put that on this picture. So the conjunctiva is a little membrane that covers over the surface of the sclera, but it doesn't go over the cornea, so on this picture it would be a layer that goes over these portions here, but it wouldn't go over the surface of the cornea. Okay, but I won't draw that on this picture. So, that's the outermost layer of the eye then. The next layer that we're going to have is a layer known as the uvea, and this contains lots of different structures. It contains the iris, it contains the choroid, it contains the ciliary body. Uh, and together, all of these structures are referred to, the U uh, to as the uvea. Okay, so let me now put this layer on my picture. So the next layer underneath this, here's the iris at the front here, and then the hole down the middle is going to be the pupil. And remember, the way that I am drawing this picture, we have taken the transverse cross-section through. We took this sort of plane like so. We took a carving knife and chopped through the eye, and that's what we're now looking at, the open surface, uh, which is why the pupil just looks like this gap here, whereas in fact, of course, it's a hole surrounded by a circle, an annulus, if you like, a ring of muscle, which is the iris. We're just seeing a section of that because of the way that we've cut this picture. I'm sorry, I can't draw in 3D. Okay, so there's the pupil in the middle, uh, and then these two portions here are the cut surface of the iris muscle, which is part of the uvea. So the uvea includes the iris. Okay, so I think I'll colour the iris in, in blue, because of course this is the portion that can have a blue uh, pigmented appearance uh, in some people, or it can have green or brown, uh, but we'll go for blue here. Okay, so here's the iris coloured in in blue. Right, and then the iris is going to be continuous posteriorly with other structures which are also part of the uvea here. So it comes back, and here, this is representing the ciliary body, like so. A little bit extreme there, but never mind. And then it continues on round to form a layer that goes the entire way around the eye at the back here, which is known as the choroid and which the retina is going to be sat on. Okay, so all of this back here, this is called the choroid. So this is part of the uvea as well. And I'll colour that in in red. So all of this, which is just a layer underneath the sclera, a very vascular layer, so it does appear red, which is why I'm colouring it in red. 
This is called the choroid. And it's going to contain a huge number of blood vessels, and one of its major functions is in uh, providing nutrients to the bottom or outer portions of the retina. Uh, so the retina will put the retina on on top of the choroid. Uh, it's going to have two supplies of blood. Uh, one supply is going to be sitting on top of the retina, and one supply is underneath the retina in the choroid. So the choroid is one of the uh, connective tissue layers that's highly vascularized that is supplying blood to the retina. Okay, now, the next structure we need to discuss is this ciliary body at the front. Okay, so the ciliary body here. And again, I want to stress that we are just seeing a two-dimensional cross-section here. Uh, so, that's why it just looks like this. In reality, this is a ring going all the way around. So, if I try and draw it on this picture, the ciliary body would be like this. Okay? it would be a ring projecting out into the center of the globe. And by the way, the globe is another uh, name people often use for the entire eye. It would be this ring projecting into the center of the globe. We're just, we just cut through in this transverse way, and therefore we're just seeing two cut edges of it. But in fact, it's a ring that goes the entire way around. Okay, so I'll color in the ciliary body here in pink. Okay, so that's the ciliary body. It also has other names. You can hear it called the ciliaris muscle as well. So we can also hear this called the ciliaris muscle or just the ciliary muscle. Uh, and this has two functions. One of its functions is to work as a muscle, but also it's going to produce the aqueous humor that's going to be in the anterior and posterior chambers. But hold that thought for a while until I've drawn on more structures here. Okay, so the next thing that I need to put on before I can explain anything more about the ciliary body is the lens and the suspensory ligaments. So I realise that it's not perfectly symmetrical here in my picture. Ideally, of course, it would be perfectly symmetrical, but I'm not perfect, unfortunately. Okay, so here is the lens here, which is, again, a transparent blob of connective tissue. Okay, it's made up of lots of cells but also connective tissue. So it's a transparent structure, the function of which is going to be to focus light. It's part of the optical system of the eyes. So we'll come back to this. And uh, it's um, a sort of smarty shape. So if I was to draw it here, again, we're only seeing a cross section, it would be like this, sitting here. Okay, so it's a sort of smarty shape sitting in the middle of the ciliary body that goes all the way around. And then connecting it to the ciliary body, you've got little fibres known as the suspensory ligaments, which is what I'm showing there. So those are the suspensory ligaments, and those will go all the way around the lens. So if again I try drawing it on this picture here, where would I put them? They'd be in this gap here between the lens there and the ciliary body around the edge. And because they form that entire ring, they have another name. The name for all of the suspensory ligaments making that entire ring in that way, it's also known as the zonule of Zin. So that ring that connects the ciliary body, the ring of the ciliary body around the edge to the lens within the middle, that's also known as the zonule of Zin. So I'll colour in the lens here in orange, and actually I'll also have the suspensory ligaments there in orange as well. Right, so we can now talk about one of the functions of the ciliary body. So the ciliary body, as I say, it is a great big lump of muscle here, and it's capable of contracting, and when the muscle cells within the ciliary body contract, what happens is that that entire ring of muscle will constrict. So, if you imagine circles of muscle cells, so lots of muscle cells arranged in great big rings, if they were all to contract, so if I draw one of these rings, so this is a ring of muscle cells all connected together, if they were all to contract, all of their lengths would decrease in size, so that would mean the entire circumference of the ring was to decrease in size, and therefore the diameter of the ring would decrease in size, so the ring would constrict. Okay, so the ciliary body, when it contracts, it's going to constrict downwards. And what is that going to do to the lens? Well, it means that the amount of pull on the lens is going to go down. So in the resting state where the ciliary body isn't constricting, uh, then 
the suspensory ligaments are pulled taut and that pulls the lens into this sort of flat shape that I've drawn here. When the ciliary body constricts down, the suspensory ligaments are going to go slack and that will allow the lens to adopt its more natural shape, which is a much more globular shape. So it might turn into a shape that looks more like this, a globular shape rather than a flat shape. And the optical power of this um, globular lens, i.e. how good it is at focusing light, uh, is going to be more powerful. It's going to be better at focusing light in this um, state here. So if you're trying to look at something that's very close to you, that, for reasons that we'll go over later on, is going to require a more powerful lens to focus the light from it onto the back of the retina, and therefore you're going to want to change the shape of the lens into a more globular shape. So the ciliary body is all about changing the topology, the shape. So topology is a fancy word for shape as far as medical students are concerned. In maths it's it's very much so related to shape, but it has a far more complicated meaning than just shape. But as far as medical students are concerned, we can use the word topology just to mean shape. Uh, so it will change the topology of the lens uh, to make it more globular, and uh, therefore it can change um, the distance away that we are focused on. So it can change how good our optical system is at focusing light, and when we're looking at objects that are a different distance away from us, we need a different power optical system to focus the light coming from different distances. But don't worry, I'll go over that in much more detail later on when we discuss the uh, focusing system of the eye. But that process of changing the topology of the lens um, so that we can focus on objects that are a different distance away is known as accommodation. And I'm not sure if accommodation has two M's in or not. I think it probably does. Accommodation. Okay. Right. Um, so that's uh, the function of the ciliary body as a muscle then. Uh, let's now talk about the function of the ciliary body in creating aqueous humour. So the ciliary body also has another function, which is to create aqueous humour. So you can see now, from the structures that I've put on here, that the eye is divided into three separate chambers. There is a chamber here in front of the iris, there is a chamber here behind the iris but in front of the lens, and there is a chamber here behind the lens. Now I'm firstly going to give you the names of these different chambers. So, the chamber in front of the iris and behind the cornea here, this is known as the anterior chamber. So this chamber here, this is the anterior chamber. This chamber here, behind the iris but in front of the lens, that is known as the posterior chamber. And you can see that the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber are continuous with one another because of the pupil. Okay, so if you were in the anterior chamber, you could get into the posterior chamber by going through the pupil. Okay, people always get confused with what the posterior chamber is. People want to call this chamber the posterior chamber, but this is not the posterior chamber. This is the posterior chamber. This chamber behind the lens, this is known as the vitreous chamber. So those are the three chambers of the eye, the anterior chamber, the posterior chamber, and the vitreous chamber. And do not confuse the vitreous chamber for the posterior chamber. Okay, so now let me discuss the aqueous humour then. Uh, so, the ciliary body, its other function is to create aqueous humour, which is the fluid that fills the anterior and posterior chambers. So, that these two chambers of the eye, the anterior and posterior chambers, they're filled with a fluid known as aqueous humour. And this fluid is created by the ciliary body and it's secreted into the posterior chamber and then it will go into the anterior chamber here. So that's the other function of the ciliary body to create the aqueous humour which fills the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. So we've now gone over the two functions of the ciliary body then and we've also had a look at the anterior chamber, the posterior chamber and the aqueous humour that's contained within them. Let's now have a look at the vitreous chamber. So the vitreous chamber contains a different sort of fluid. It's also filled with something, uh, but it is filled with something known as the vitreous humour. 
and the vitreous humor is a different sort of consistency to the aqueous humor. The aqueous humor is a sort of viscous fluid, whereas the vitreous humor is more a jelly. Okay, if you've ever done dissection of the eye, you'll know what I mean. It's, it's semi-solid, basically. When you take it out, it remains in one piece, like a sort of jelly. It's not a fluid that just changes its shape. It's a sort of jelly structure. Okay, so the vitreous chamber is filled with the vitreous humour. So to finish our picture, what we need to do is put the retina on, the very important part here. So on top then of the choroid, you're going to have the retina here, and the retina will be continuous with the optic nerve behind, like so. So here's the retina on this lateral side of the eye over here. And I will colour in uh, the retina in in turquoise. Okay, so all of this, this is the retina, and then um, the retina is continuous with the optic nerve because the cells which are going to transmit the electrical signal coming from the eye uh, to the central nervous system, to the brain, their cell bodies are going to be in the retina and they're going to send their axons into the optic nerve, so that's why the retina truly is continuous uh, with the optic nerve behind here. Okay, like so. So this is the retina then, and then we've got the actual neural tissue of the optic nerve behind. And you'll notice what I've left right at the middle here. There is this gap down the middle of the optic nerve, and that isn't a mistake that I've left that there, that is there. It's known as the central canal of the optic nerve. There is a gap down the middle of the optic nerve where the neural tissue parts and there is a tube effectively through the middle of the optic nerve called the central canal of the optic nerve. And this is the canal through which the central retinal artery and the central retinal vein run. So I've talked about how the retina has two blood supplies. The outer portions of the retina, or the lower portions of the retina, depending on how you want to look at it, those are going to get their blood supply from the choroid underneath, which is a connective tissue layer with a large uh, vascular bed within it. The parts of the retina that are towards the inner portion of the eye, or the top portions of the retina, depending on how you want to look at it, they're going to get their blood supply from blood vessels that are actually on the surface of the retina, and these blood vessels are going to be branches from the central retinal artery. So here's the central retinal artery, and they're going to drain into the central retinal vein. So there is an artery and a vein running in the central canal, uh, and the artery is going to give off loads of branches which will supply the surface of the retina, and the vein will form from lots of branches which will be draining the surface of the retina. So we have the central retinal artery and vein running in that central canal on both eyes. Okay, right, so I believe that is all the structures that I want to discuss uh, in this section on the anatomy of the eye. Uh, I will remind you that we have taken a transverse cross-section through the right-hand eye here. This is the medial side, this is the lateral side, anterior, posterior. If you wanted to know the anatomy of the left-hand eye, all you'd have to do is take the mirror image of this picture, and then you'd have the equivalent for the left-hand side. Right, the next thing that I want to do is I want to show you what the retina looks like when you have a look through an ophthalmoscope. So, landmarks that you see on the back of the retina when you look for an ophthalmoscope. So, firstly, let me write down the word ophthalmoscope. So, there is a, a device that you can use to look at the back of someone's eye, look at the retina of someone's eye, which is called an ophthalmoscope. It's also called a thunderscope. Okay? And what this does is it shines a light into the eye, and you need to get very close in order to do it. Uh, and the light will reflect off the back of the retina and then it will hopefully come back out and you'll be able to see it. Okay, so the principle is that you can have a look at the back of someone's retina using one of these uh, devices, an ophthalmoscope, also called a thunderscope. So what does it actually look like when you do use one of these devices and you see the back of someone's retina? Okay, well again we'll do the right hand side. So generally what you see is a circle like so. And um, but I'll orient you here, so this is going to be the medial side, this is going to be the lateral side, superior and inferior. 
okay, and of course we are looking at the back of the retina. So, towards the medial side, what you will see is a yellow sort of spot that is the optic nerve disc. This is where the optic nerve is joining the eye. So remember, we are looking at the right-hand eye here. This is medial, this is lateral, this is superior, this is inferior. So this is in the right place. So this is what we call the optic disc. So this is where the optic nerve is joining uh, the back of the eye, and you've got all of the axons from cells that are all over the retina converging on this spot to go into the optic nerve. And this generally has a yellowish appearance like so. So this is the optic disc. It has other names as well. You can also call it the optic nerve head or the optic nerve papilla. All of these different terms are used for the optic disc, but it appears yellow and it is a, a, a structure that you can always see when you're um, using an ophthalmoscope. Now, from the optic disc, you will see the central retinal artery and the central retinal veins branches. Because remember, the central retinal artery is coming through the central canal of the optic nerve, and it's going to be arriving on the surface of the retina in a hole that will be at the centre of the optic disc, like so. Okay, and it's then going to branch. And this is generally the branching pattern that you will see of the central retinal artery. It will have two branches that go up, like so, and it will then have two branches that go down, like this. So this typical V-shaped pattern. We've got two branches going up, two branches going down, like that. And the central retinal vein, the branches that are forming it, they generally have the same pattern. So generally you get two coming from the top, and two coming from the bottom, like so. Now, uh, the central retinal veins do not look particularly blue at all. In fact, they don't really look blue at all uh, when you actually see them. They're distinguishable from the arteries, not because they're a different colour, but because they're generally much bigger than the arteries. The arteries are generally much more narrow, whilst the veins are much bigger. Okay, so that's the pattern of the central retinal arteries, branches, and the contributing branches to the central retinal vein. The other structure that I want to discuss that you can see on the back of the retina is something known as the macula lutea. So, the macula lutea is a uh, spot that is supposed to appear yellow, but it doesn't really appear yellow. So, macula lutea, if you read this literally, macula in some old language means spot. So this means spot. And lutea means yellow. However, this spot doesn't really appear yellow. It appears more a sort of browny colour. So it's a brown sort of spot at the back of the retina. And the reason it appears brown is that the cells at the back there do have some sort of pigment that uh, changes the colour of the retina. So it is a distinguishable spot because it does look uh, different, a different sort of colour from the rest of the retina everywhere else. In addition, it's distinguishable because there won't be many blood vessels in this region, so most of the retina will be covered in little blood vessels uh, that you'll be able to see with the ophthalmoscope. I've just put on the major branches here, but you know, the whole thing will have branches of these uh, central retinal arteries, and uh, sorry, this, the central retinal artery uh, and um, veins that are going to drain into the central retinal vein. Whereas this macula lutea is generally vessel free. So the vessels are, go around it. Now, right at the centre of the macula lutea is where the fovea is going to be, which we will come back to later. The fovea is the portion of the retina that has the capacity to send the highest acuity information to the brain. It's the portion that you use to see things in detail. So if you were trying to read something, you would always get the centre of your eye focused on it. Uh, you wouldn't ever try and read something from the periphery of one of your eyes in the, you know, you wouldn't try and read something that you're holding in the periphery of your vision. You'd make sure that it was right in the centre of your vision. And the reason that we do that is because you are making sure that the fovea is the portion that's processing that visual information, and the fovea has the highest visual acuity it can see in the most detail. Okay, uh, the proper name for the fovea, the full name is the fovea centralis. So the fovea is a portion that's uh, 
deep inside the macula lutea, at the centre of the macula lutea. And as we'll discuss later when we have a look at the structure of the retina, the fovea actually is far thinner than the rest of the retina, so it's a little pit in the centre of the retina. So I might colour it in, in black there. It's much more shallow. There is a little pit. If you were a little man walking on the surface of the retina, you would go down into a shallow portion uh, when you went into the fovea. Okay, so let me give you some figures as to how large the macula lutea and how large the fovea centralis are. So the macula lutea is generally quoted as being around 5 millimeters in diameter, so half a centimeter in diameter at the back of your retina. Whereas the fovea centralis is generally quoted as having a diameter of around 1.5 uh, millimeters. So that puts it in perspective how large uh, these structures are on the back of the retina. Okay, so those are the major structures that uh, you can see if you look at someone's retina using an ophthalmoscope. Right, so we'll have a break there. We've now covered the anatomy of the eye. Uh, what we'll do in the next video is we'll discuss how the eye is going to focus light onto the retina.